You know, you know what's better than one foldable Apple iPhone? I'm it's two! Guess that, it's yeah, two! Oh, that is very loud. Foldable Apple iPhones. Apple has purportedly asked Foxconn to create two foldable iPhone prototype shells. This is the report. This is the rumor. We all know that Apple's been paying attention to the marketplace. They've been seeing what different brands have been up to. And, you know, Samsung, on the other hand, they've just been putting stuff out. They're not sitting back and waiting. They're just doing it. And how have they done it? Well, obviously, we have the most famous product. Look at it's right over here. It's still over there. We have the most famous product, this little, that little folder right there, uh -huh. Z Fold 2, the latest of the large folding devices. But there's, there's a little sibling that doesn't get talked about as much, the flip model, which is the clamshell version. And it's around portability, and it folds... Uh, from a portrait into a clamshell, etc. I know our pal Austin Evans loves this device. I saw an Instagram post from him saying it's his daily driver. Mm, it's official. Yeah, he loves the Z Flip. And so you're trying to figure out if you're Apple, you're sitting back and you're saying, which is the more Apple type of approach here? Mm. You're saying to yourself, do people want something more portable, something reminiscent of the flip phone days? Would that be a better complement to our current lineup? Or is it the big boy uh, Z Fold style device uh -huh. that is practically a tablet and it's unfolded? And then which one also disrupts our iPad market even more so? Because obviously this one does not. No. But when you get into the larger foldables, all of a sudden you're kind of close size-wise to some of those smaller iPads. So they might say, hey, it's going to bite. We want everybody to have an iPad, an iPhone, an Apple Watch, and all the rest. But we don't mm -hmm. want to have these things overlap. But maybe Apple's unsure. Maybe they want to see what Foxconn can do as far as fabricating one of each of these styles, or maybe they want to do them both at once, which would kind of be quite a moment as far as a live uh, event is concerned. Live? They're not live anymore. I mean, they broadcast to us live, but they're pre-recorded because yeah. they're doing the, the, what are they calling them? What do they call those events? Uh, keynotes. Keynotes. There yeah. it is. They're doing a virtual keynotes as opposed to the live ones which as we mentioned previously we don't mind uh, actually they've been pretty good so far the company has apparently asked its foxconn uh manufacturer its biggest supplier to create two prototype foldable shells with displays this is coming via the taiwanese website united daily news apple's two prototypes reflect two very different approaches to foldable phones in the industry they actually say the other model is closer to Microsoft's Surface Duo. Hmm. Two screens that resemble a book held together by a hinge. Interesting. Huh. So maybe Apple isn't looking at the large foldable OLED in the Z Fold stylings, but maybe they're inspired by what Microsoft was attempting with the dual setup, which is interesting because as far as the adoption and sentiment and sort of what I've heard coming back, it's like, People seem to be more interested in the way Samsung has done the folding tablet to phone than the way that Microsoft did it. But anyway, Apple's paying attention. And one thing that Apple has on its side, Will, always seems to have on its side is time. Because it seems like the Apple audience is willing to wait for Apple's version, for Apple's take on some of these new form factors and new developments. Mm. Apple gets to sit back and watch and see what the market does. Hey, do people pick up and purchase that Microsoft product? Do they pick up and purchase the Samsung product? And what do, what do our Apple versions of that look like? And then yes. let's prototype and then let's wait and let's play with it. And then we bring it to market and people gobble it up. Yes. It's a benefit. Yeah. It, it always reminds me that they've always been the company that does things too early or too late. Hmm. Except for the original iPhone. That was right on time. Yeah. 
And an iPod, I guess. Yeah. Although, funny enough, little iPod story, I had plenty of MP3 players before I got an iPod. Uh -huh. I actually probably had three or four MP3 players before I got an iPod. So none of them were amazing. They certainly weren't iPods, and the ecosystem didn't exist to get tracks because iTunes didn't exist. And though that didn't really matter because you had Napster and everything else. <laughs> yeah. And I was that, just going to say. Yeah, and so you found a way to do it, but it just was obviously a less polished experience. All the interfaces were different, file types and formats. and Yeah, it was very Wild West. Bit rates. You never knew really what you were getting. Uh, but yeah, I had, a, I had a Rio player. It was a Rio Diamond MP3 player. I have this this unit sitting around somewhere. There's a black model in the center there, which I actually bought from EB Games, which is the Canadian equivalent of GameStop. Mm. Who knew where, who was supposed to be selling these things? HMV as well. Like who who yeah. who really? Uh, where does an MP3 player get sold? We had Future Shop. I also had the had the Creative Nomad, which was in the shape of a of a disc player, a CD player, portable. That had much bigger storage, and it didn't. It did not take removable storage. It had an actual kind of small hard drive in it. Oh, so these things existed. It was kind of fun. There was a marketplace for it, and then I had mini disc. I've been around a block, but the uh, the point here is that Apple has built up now enough loyalty with its customer base and the strength of its ecosystem. It doesn't have to be first in order to be successful. And in fact, you could make the argument that it shouldn't be first. I know a lot of people come in and say, when Jobs was around, they were doing surprising stuff. It wasn't so predictable. It's like, true. But one of the things that comes along with scale is responsibility. Once you have this tremendous fan base, you can't afford to miss. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of more, it's a mature company. Obviously, when it comes to the car that we talked about previously, the game's gonna be different because they haven't done it before. But even there, I think we can safely say they're late as well, considering how long Tesla's been doing it. Yeah. Electric cars and autonomous stuff, AI and the rest of it. Hopefully they do it, right? We'll see what Apple does with the foldable. But, it, I mean, based on the patent filings, the uh, consistency of rumors, it looks like they're at least considering they probably will do something. Today's sponsor, DoorDash. I got a little DoorDash story for you. Okay. Yeah, we were, uh, we were looking for some Thai food. You know, uh, Will, little Will, not big Will, my little Will, mm -hmm. huge, huge fan of Thai food. Which one? Oh, you want to like know the exact... What kind? You want to know the exact restaurant? Like Thai or something? Here? No, 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 no. He just likes a, he likes a fried rice okay. with, sh with some shrimp in it, um. and he will devour a mango salad. Oh. He just loves a mango salad. Now, to be, to be honest, that would be his order, but he'll eat like pretty much... I mean, if you got the um, the spring rolls going on, you know what I got? I got the cold rolls, actually. Have you had those before? The fresh rolls? Yeah, the fresh rolls. Yeah, with rice paper. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. It's a, it's almost like a salad in a in a, in a it's like a yeah. convenient. Yeah. It's, it's like a one bite salad, without the headache of having to stab individual components. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Very convenient. Yeah, it's so convenient. Those yeah. and there's a little dip that goes with it, and then, yeah. But anyway, none of it would be possible without DoorDash. Obviously, I'm not cooking this up in the kitchen, and that's fine. But the family enjoys it, and therefore, I boot up the DoorDash, and it stays super convenient. And uh, we get to to we get to watch some Mandalorian while we're okay. waiting, and then just shows up, and the Thai food is there, and it's delicious. So you already know. You watch this show, you already know I use DoorDash all the time. DoorDash is my delivery app of choice. You can get everything you want, whether it's a Thai, a local Thai spot or it's some of the national favorites, they're on there as well. It's a lot to choose from. Chipotle, Wendy's, Cheesecake Factory, if you're looking for those name brand. But also, you'd be surprised, man. It's a huge inventory of different delicious foods to choose from. Right now, our listeners and viewers are going to get $5 off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter the code Lou Later. Don't forget the code Lou Later. That's free money. That's $5 off and zero delivery fees on your first order of $15. It's available in the Apple App Store. It's on Android as well. Super easy, convenient. You track your order the whole way there. And you can uh, ha enjoy some entertainment, get some work done while your food is on its way and delicious 
And you yourself can also devour a mango salad. Mm. Imagine that. DoorDash.com, DoorDash app, and the code Lou later. All right, we got a story here about Apple's weirdness around chargers. Obviously, we, we had a lot of headlines when they decided to get rid of the charger in the box for the latest iPhone. But then it, it brought up a lot of questions for users around which charger should I have? Which mm. charger do I have at home? And is it going to work? Pro like, is it enough for whatever fast charge capability I have on my current device? And what about the other devices around the house, iPads and so forth? It's kind of confusing. Mm -hmm. Now, the way in which the rest of the marketplace figured this out is with that little PD component. When you see USB PD, power delivery, mm -hmm. those are smart chargers that can figure out the, the specification of the device that's been plugged in in order to deliver the... Uh, the correct amount of power in, yep. in the correct format that that device can take advantage of. A lot of Apple chargers do not have PD up until recently. And as a consequence, even though you may have an Apple charger with a higher stated wattage, it may not correctly charge some of your devices. So the example in this article, 9 to 5 Mac, if you have the 29, the older 29 watt power brick, it can't charge the MagSafe Duo you can't plug it into the MagSafe Duo as your charge brick. And you know, all these different devices are not coming with chargers. So you're having to figure out which brick you should have. And you probably thought you were gonna plug some of these devices into older chargers. That charger draws 15 watts of power. You're sitting there saying, I got a 29 watt power brick, I'm probably okay. Not exactly. And the same thing is said for the 18 watt charger that was supplied with last year's iPhone 11 Pro which couldn't initially charge the HomePod Mini. So what happens? Does it not charge at all? So the 29 watt power brick doesn't support USB-C PD 2.0 or 3.0. So even though it's capable of delivering enough power, it doesn't have that special power delivery. Now the reason that this is important, the tw the the 29 watt power adapter only outputs in two configurations, 14.5 volts times two amps for 29 watts, the maximum, or 5.2 volts times 2.4 amps for 12.48 watts. It's just two, it's essentially two deliveries and that's it. Anything in between, get out of my face as far as that charger's concerned. Mm. This is the kind of stuff where you hop on Amazon and you're like, yeah, I want a PD charger but you don't necessarily need to go in depth as to figuring out why. You just assume it's gonna charge anything below yeah. that wattage, but PD is the necessary component in that scenario. So you already know my vote on this matter is to basically avoid Apple chargers anyways. And we have an official uh, sponsor on Unbox Therapy, Anchor Chargers. All this stuff has PD and has been PD for a long period of time, including the brand new Anchor Nano, which is this tiny little power brick capable of 20 watt power delivery over USB Type-C. Of course, they have bigger bricks if you need more wattage, depending on the components that you want to plug in, but at least you know you're going to get PD. Now, the other option, obviously, is that you could pick up Apple's latest power brick, the latest 30-watt power brick, and then that also supports PD. So they finally hopped on the PD train, but just keep in mind, as you're picking up these new Apple peripherals that don't include power bricks, mm. the power bricks you have lying around might not be the perfect fit and probably aren't the perfect fit huh. for a lot of these new peripherals. Speaking of power bricks, how about Huawei certifying a 135 watt charger in China? You know these charge races been going on, mostly amongst the Chinese brands. Uh, Xiaomi has been has been uh, in that race. OnePlus, to a certain extent, has been in that race. Obviously, Oppo has been in that race. They may be the current champs. I'm not sh I'm not certain. Huawei wants to be a part of that. You know I like a fast charge. Obviously, there are arguments against it. People think that they're uh, degrading battery life on these fast charges, that there's too much heat. Of course, at the same time, the t technology is racing to outpace some of those drawbacks. So... You have to wait and see how it's been implemented over here. But uh, over 100 watts is bananas. 135 watts is obviously bananas. It, it supports 5 volt, 3 amp, all the way up to 20 volt, 6.75 amp, equating to that mind-boggling 135 watt rate. 
They previously maxed out at 66 watts on their supercharged technology, but they obviously, well, they're looking for any type of competitive edge here, mm -hmm. seeing as how they've been kind of strong-armed out of most of the marketplace outside of their domestic Chinese customers. And therefore, in that Chinese marketplace, they've got competition, pretty stiff competition, particularly in this particular spec around fast charging. But I don't know if this gives them the crown. Maybe we can get a quick update. What was Oppo's fastest? Was it also 135? And it, it was close. It might have been 125. Oppo announces 125. And the 125 was doing charging a phone in 20 minutes, the whole deal. Yeah, pretty, pretty amazing. Anyway, we've covered it here on this show. You can go check out the Later Clips channel. That's where you can watch this show in clips. And every fast charger that comes out and breaks some record, we pretty much covered on this show. So yeah. you can go find all the comparisons. But Huawei is now in the running for fastest with their new 135 watt tech. Samsung has confirmed the Galaxy S21 event for January 14th. They're, of course, going to launch more than one phone, and we've pretty much seen all of it leaked at this point as far as what it's going to look like, which is kind of to be expected in this day and age. The invitation went out. They'll be launching the S21, S21 Plus, and S21 Ultra. It's on January the 14th. The tagline, welcome to the everyday epic. Interesting. Is there an epic collaboration there? There is an epic collaboration, of course, because uh, Epic loves Samsung because Samsung lets them do their installer or be installed through the Samsung-specific store on Android. Yeah. Anyway, I just picked that up. I'm sure someone else has, has recognized this. But w what kind of epic integration? I'm curious. Will it be... Does everyone get f uh, free Fortnite stuff? How are they going to leverage that partnership? But it's definitely meaningful to both parties. I don't know for sure. Maybe they just like the word epic, but it seems a little too fitting given yeah, the current state of affairs. On the nose. With, yeah, between Apple and Epic Games and Fortnite and all the rest of it. So we'll see what that means. Uh, anyway, the event is happening 7 a.m. Pacific. That's 10 a.m. Eastern. That's our uh, time zone here. I don't know. Maybe we should do a live, live stream. Maybe we should do a live during the event. I don't know. You guys let, let us know down in the comments who wants to do a live. But we will have the devices and be doing the unboxing video, obviously, as well. Uh, I'm curious. You know, every time Samsung puts out some new devices, it's interesting. Uh, this new Ultra piece of the lineup has offered up an opportunity to do some, to get a little more outlandish on the giant side of phones. Now yeah. it has supposedly S Pen support. I'm curious how they're going to manage where you put your S Pen, things like this. There's, a, there's obviously going to be more information coming up shortly. But yeah, there's a GIF actually. If you want to catch a glimpse at the S21 5G at the bottom there, you go into the camera <laughs> lens. The one thing they're doing that's, uh, I guess, a little different is the two-tone effect on the back uh -huh. with the lavender and the rose gold kind of look there. That's a slightly different approach. But I know you were angry about the fact that that one module is outside of the main camera yeah. unit. That was uh, that, uh, causing you all kinds of distress. The flash, maybe you were telling me know. about how you weren't you were losing sleep over it and everything. Very else. upset. So, yeah. LG is going to demo a bendable OLED gaming TV at CES 2021. CES 2021. I don't even know what that is, how it's going to happen. Obviously, it's going to be virtual, but companies still got to launch products and they plan for this event way in advance for CES, which normally takes place in Vegas, but obviously it's a different type of year this year. Now you're thinking bendable. What do they mean bendable? I've seen curved displays. LG's been working with curved displays for a long period of time. So have other manufacturers, Samsung and others. Bendable meaning this one can be both flat and curved. Well, depending on what you're doing, you can have the display adjust in uh, real time. That's oh. the beauty of OLED and the flexibility of OLED. So if you want to watch a feature film or you want to watch the next season of Mandalorian when it comes out, then you're going to want a flat screen for that. Mm -hmm. But what about when you want the immersive gaming experience when all of a sudden you boot up the Forza or whatever it might be on the racing? Project Cars, I was playing that back in the day. Do people still play Project Cars? I don't know. <laughs> but if I ever build another racing simula simulator, then I think i got to boot up the Project Cars again. 
I was talking to Lincoln about that on the way over here. He's very upset that we don't have that racing simulator anymore. Yeah. In fact. So anyway, this one can do both. Uh, what else does it say here? A 48-inch 4K bendable cinematic sound OLED. Switch between flat and curved. Enjoy videos and gaming. It morphs into a curved screen with up to a 1,000 millimeter radius for immersive gaming. That's pretty cool. Also, for, for some reason, variable refresh rates from 40 to 120 hertz. And then they're also preparing up to a, a gaming monitor up to 360 hertz. So they got some products lined up for CES, including the adaptable, bendable display. You sent me this story, but uh, yeah, it's getting a lot of coverage, at least here, coverage in North America. Chinese tech billionaire Jack Ma was removed from his own reality TV show and has not been seen in public for two months after falling foul of President Xi and over anti-regulation speech. Now, I first of all, There's first of all, right <laughs> you got targeted on that ad right there. Yeah. First of all, Willie Do. Okay. Let's just say, for the record. This is all speculation. All of this, everything we're about to touch is speculation. So we got to take it for what it is. Obviously, this headline is just like coming right at you, dailymail.co.uk. But it's covered, it's all over the web, this story. This is a prominent individual. I feel the need to let people know who maybe, I don't know, don't follow it. AliExpress, Alipay, all the rest of it. Uh, one of the richest guys in China was the richest guy in China. I think he's number three, three. now. Yeah. Because stuff is going on, obviously. But just a, an icon, I guess. And, 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 and as far as entrepreneurs in China are concerned, an icon. Similar exactly. to like Elon Musk. Yes, here. we had to draw the correlation so people understand and are not familiar with the matter. A significant individual, tremendous scale to the, to the enterprise, net worth $58.4 billion as of January. Uh, not normal for somebody like this to stop communicating with the world, right? He was very active on social media uh -huh. prior to this whole thing going down. We covered a little bit of what happened as far as this new venture, this ant group that he had been working on that was set to IPO and set records into the plus $30 billion that was blocked by the Chinese government. He comes out and gives a speech where he's a little bit critical of the Chinese government. And then, according to these reports, he's a little tough to find. And so people start to get a little bit suspicious now, is it impossible that an individual like him just uh, takes a little downtime and realizes that he ran afoul of the party line and just says, you know what, on his own accord, says, I'm going to lay low right now. Uh-huh. Just take some time to think. It's possible. Is it possible that an individual like this gets told, you're about to lay low, sir? That can happen as well. I think, I feel like that can happen as well. Yeah. So whether it's a PR thing, whether it's a business decision, or whether it's uh, some type of instruction, the fact of the matter is the guy pretty much hasn't been heard, uh, heard from for a while. And then the other piece of it, he was working as a member of a Dragon's Den Shark Tank style TV show. Mm -hmm. And it was happening... In Africa, what was the name of that show? I, I want to get it right. I mean, I haven't it, seen the show. It's called uh, Africa's Business Heroes. Africa's Business Heroes. He disappeared from that TV show just before the November final. His photo was scrubbed from the show's judging panel webpage. A spokesperson from Alibaba said, told the Financial Times that he can no longer be a part of the judging panel due to a schedule conflict. However... Just previous to that, he had tweeted he couldn't wait to meet the contestants for the final. And then no activity since then on his Twitter account. And he it had regularly seen prior to that several tweets per day.
I mean, all we're doing here, yeah. all we're doing here is stating what the reports are saying and then reflecting on those reports next to the fact that he had made these remarks prior that could in no way be perceived as positive remarks mm -hmm. for the government there. All right, so let's just reflect on that combination of things and the fact that he's not currently, you know, that he's not currently being heard from. Yeah. It, may, it would be hard not to be suspicious at the moment. Yeah. I mean, I was looking at uh, Twitter trends and it was trending for the whole night. Yeah. Uh, number two. Yeah. We can't understate the deal. fact that, that this guy is, a, is a, a really famous guy in China, in that region. And what the equivalent of somebody go, going off the grid for two months here would be like. Mm -hmm. Like if you didn't, if no one knew where Elon Musk was for the same period of time. Right. Yeah. Now, I'm sure some people know where he is. Uh, and, and like I said, it's important for us to say that it's possible that this is just a strategic decision on his behalf, given what has transpired. It's possible. But it's certainly curious. I think we can say that much. Mm. Certainly curious. Speaking of China, apparently, now I'm always, when I'm reading this South China Morning Post, sometimes I am just caught right off guard at the way an article is written as fact when it's obviously, spec, some, there's some speculative aspects of it, but it's kind of uh, positioned as fact. Young employees rebel against Chinese work ethic by being lazy Refusing overtime and hiding in the toilets. They call it touching fish. <laughs> hmm. It's like, how many? Where? How do we know? Who are these young employees? Do, do we, this is what you just need to know. Is That's there an it. accusation against somebody specifically? Young staff slack off by not working overtime, delivering average quality work, going to the toilet often, playing with their phones, and reading novels at work. They say it's a silent rebellion against the culture of working overtime for little reward and a reflection on their disappointment with their salary. So obviously, I guess this is like anonymous tips or tips via social media that have, that have somehow uh, indicated to this writer, Alice Yan, that this is an actual trend that's going on. We do know for a fact, having visited the place, that the work culture is intense. Yes. For certain, but I have a hard time imagining that it would be easy for an individual to last very long in that environment, slacking off all the time, touching fish. Being a touching fish. Now, by the way, the that term is borrowed from the famous Chinese proverb that states, muddy waters make it easy to catch fish. It means one should take advantage of a crisis to chase personal gain. Um... So they've kind of modernized, I guess, the ter the term a little yeah, bit. Still very, like, poetic. Yes. It could be interpreted many different ways, but uh, <laughs> yeah, there's always a meaning to it, to something, like a two words or something. So anyway, I'm 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 kind of curious how this goes, long term. As we've mentioned previously, the culture there is pretty intense. Jack Ma, one of those guys, actually, that kind of, that was a, was a part of that nine to nine yeah he wasn't a touching fish N no he touched not no fish all. definitely not early on he was touching no fish but the Very question is working. how sustainable is it long term how much work can you get out of people and uh and where does where how, how much efficiency can you get out of people and keep them interested and keep them invested and and uh, maybe now there that threshold is being met uh -huh. and that you're starting to get some as they're calling it, silent rebellion amongst the workforce. Bitcoin. Are you following the Bitcoin stuff? Here and there, yeah. I heard it's doing well. <laughs> Bitcoin. It's all about Bitcoin. Yeah. It's, uh, Bitcoin is mainstream, man. Uh, it's everybody is talking to me about Bitcoin yeah. just in my life, outside of the internet. Hmm. People are the word has tremendous buzz and you have of course governments are writing up all types of stimulus packages 
to combat the uh, the COVID effect on the economy and in, in various world economies. And people are, well, people are doing what people do. They're looking at the stock market. They're looking at, they're looking at gold. They're looking everywhere. Well, mm -hmm. in an effort to try to escape the potential inflation that could come along with these enormous stimulus packages. This is an economic show, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to remind you. Yeah. That's the, that's the root of it. Bitcoin is one of those places. It's a pr uh, futuristic and uh, limited and all the, you know, all the sales pitch that's been going on. It's just, it's perfect for right now. Yes. Bitcoin is just perfect for right now. And so we've seen the, the value skyrocketing. But I need to get an update from you because this, I'm on Reuters right now. Okay. And they're telling me that it fell sharply on Monday. Is this true? Nothing sharp about that. I mean, it is uh, down. Well, once it reached uh, 30,000 yeah. <laughs> for Bitcoin, it immediately jumped another it went right back 2, up. Yeah. And then it went down again. Yeah. According to <laughs> today. Yeah, today. So this yeah. this article was that see that sharp fall right there. That right there, it went below 30 grand from a high of like what 34 33 33 then it drops down to the high 20s and now it starts to climb again as the day has gone on since i selected this particular article so it does showcase a certain amount of volatility which is still there however i mean if you just just please do me a favor and take that chart and put like a year on it this is just this is just out of control put a five year on it this is just, look at the current spike. My God. So anyway, yeah, Bitcoin is super hot and it's becoming, it's becoming impossible to predict what is, well, maybe not impossible. I, I would say judging from that previous high, there, there probably will be some correction coming sometime soon, but it seems actually surprisingly static uh-huh well it, i mean like give me the give me the one give me the one year again give me the one year again on that like yeah we're super high right now okay this chart's a bit deceiving because why is that 10 and the other one is 30 it's definitely this chart's a bit deceiving but anyway point point being is it's been above 10 grand for a while now I guess for, for, for people that are interested in investing, yeah, it's it's a huge cliff right now. That they're, You're climbing a huge cliff. That chart is much better. Yeah. That chart is does a much better job of illustrating how much higher we are right now. It is such a bizarre psychology, though, for me, because you, it seems hard to buy right now. But yet, it isn't for so many people. You would think... Mm -hmm. Look, there's obviously tremendous complexity here as to how people are trying to make money in this, in, in any kind of trading, whether it's currency, stocks, or otherwise. But there is no doubt that there's tremendous hype around Bitcoin right now. And I expect it to, to, to give you the evidence. I expect it to make a story about how it was, how it was tumbling a little bit, which is the headline of my particular article. And no, then, no. and then in, it bounced back. in that amount of time between reading that and shooting this, it rebounded Within the other way again. An hour or two. Yeah, an hour or two. So it goes to show you how much action is happening around Bitcoin. It continues, man. But he's into Bitcoin. Google employees announced the creation of a union. This is big news. That doesn't happen every day. More than 200 Google employees on Monday announced the creation of a union, a historic first at a major technology company. Now, normally... Major technology companies don't really like the idea of unions too much. Mm. Uh, I guess for I guess there's probably all kinds of reasons why mm -hmm. union uh, attempts to create collective bargaining so that everyone can say, well, they can say we're going to strike, we're not going to work if yeah. this thing is not met, and we don't agree with what you're doing. It's you know, power to the to the workers. Of course, it can go. It can go the other way as well. It can it can be problematic as well in certain circumstances where that group of 
workers may actually demand something that might not be great for the company. That's possible too. Yep. The important thing here is that it is historic and it's a big deal. However, it is only representative of 200 Google employees. That's the key. When you see the headlines, it seems like a big deal. And then you see the number that are actually involved in the creation being 200. Do you know, Will, how many people work at Google? Uh, 120,000. Oh. 120,000 and they only got 200. So it makes me a little curious about the... Now, I don't know. I guess all, all things have to start somewhere. Yeah. But it makes me a bit curious about how appealing the idea is to the remainder of the employees or if the employees already feel that their needs are being met and they don't want to pay dues to be a part of a union that where they feel that their whatever it might be, their salary or whatever else doesn't need any improvement as far as negotiations are concerned. Uh -huh. So there must be a reason why up until this point, the big tech firms have been able to avoid the unionization of their employees, whether it be through, through salaries or other incentives. And so we'll have to wait and see how successful this particular union is. But obviously if it gathers steam, it does have the potential to shift or alter the course of Alphabet. Mm -hmm. uh, because we haven't seen this model previously. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Like, it's like instant walkout. <laughs> it's like, whoa. There's 200 of us. We're not, yeah. we're not willing. It, it, it really, these things do depend to, to a certain extent on scale, right? It has to be disruptive mm -hmm. to the company and to the company's ability to operate. That's where the leverage takes place. And so... There's not really that, I don't think there's that much power. Maybe it depends who these 200 employees are. Yeah. Maybe there's not that much power currently. But again, if they can make it attractive or if they can get high profile employees as a part of it, grow. I don't know. Maybe that leverage can swing a little bit. We have to wait and see. Oh, by the way, there, there have been some, some issues at Google. You had a 20,000 worker walkout that happened relatively recently over uh, the company's handling of certain issues and events that took place hmm. regarding uh, accusations of misconduct. Yes. So where are those 20,000 on the union, though? I don't know. We have to wait and see. Yeah. You remember this Quibi thing? Quibi was like, we're doing a, a big budget stuff, but for the small screen for your phone and look out Netflix and Mm -hmm. We got a billion dollars and a former Disney executive and and then nobody watched it. And this was during the pandemic. Yeah, maybe. The launch, which was good timing for them, right? That's great. It's a great question. We were talking about Disney Plus earlier. Yeah. Whether or not pandemic is great timing or bad timing because people are looking for stuff to watch and they got lots of time or more yeah. time on their hands. But then on the same token, they're not really splurging on the cash. Yeah. So it's hard to say, but I think it worked out for Disney Plus, less so for Quibi. Anyway, the, re the new uh, rumor here is that Quibi is in talks to sell its shows to Roku. I guess there's no reason for those shows to go to waste. And if the, if the service is going down, the shows could find a new home and get seen by somebody. Um, it's funny, though, because we were just talking about how Roku, as a streaming device, is independent of content unlike the others that try to promote their specific content, whether it's an Amazon Fire TV or an Apple TV or uh, I guess the Chromecast to a lesser extent, but all these big brands do streaming boxes and don't try to push their content on you. If Roku acquires Quibi's content, then you have to imagine that they'll be pushing that content on yep. you. Uh, so that could change drastically change Roku's model around yes. it, how it perceives content and whether it continues to go down the path of creating exclusive content as opposed to just being a hub for your apps. Uh, so this would give the Roku channel exclusive access to Quibi's slate of programming. And Roku thinks that this content will have a better chance on its platform since there's more people uh, to get the content in front of. The service was headed by, Quibi I'm talking about, was headed by former HP CEO Meg Whitman and former Disney chairman and movie producer Jeffrey Katzenberg. They managed to raise $2 billion in funding before the app was released. 
And then Katzenberg tried to get companies, including Facebook and NBC Universal, to pick up Quibi programming ahead of its demise. So it was like so weird. Raise so much money, have all this content, and then pretty much recognize rapidly that it's not going to work and they don't want to compete in that marketplace and they need to start shopping the content independently of the service. Tesla, I have a cool little time lapse here of Tesla's full self-driving FSD. And I believe this is the first time ever that some, or, or at least the least amount of user input on a trip from San Francisco to LA with almost no input at all on the entire trip. It's a fairly significant trip. How long does that take? Is that about four hours, I believe? Four hours in a car? SF to LA time. Drive time. Six, oh wow, six to eight hours. I guess there's traffic the involvement traffic. and other, other factors. Somebody right now is saying, I can make it faster. But anyway, it takes a while. Fa fairly significant trip. So it's meaningful uh, that they were able to do it with almost limited input. And if you watch the time last bit video, you can see there's pr pretty much no input along the way. Uh, there's a couple of uh, rough moments, I guess. Rough moments? Well, there's a, there was a moment where there was some debris. And the, the driver took control of the wheel just kind of preemptively not wanting to take the risk that the self-driving would be. And of course, this is sort of how the self-driving stuff is right now, is you've got to be near the wheel and ready to interact with it in case there's an issue. So what are you laughing at now? <laughs> I thought you meant like when the driver takes control, it's like off a cliff or something. It's like about to like go off the cliff or something. Something comical. That's what I was thinking. Here we it's go like, again. <laughs> Here we go again. Well, we're going to have a little a willy do laugh session over here as he envisions yeah, a Model 3 a minute, going yeah. off a cliff and it's the funniest thing he's ever it's imagined like, in his now life. You take control. <laughs> yeah. No, I think there was some debris on a road at some point during the time lapse and he preemptively grabbed the wheel to we don't know whether or not a full self driving. He probably should have just went with it, but it's your you're doing the test. You might have done the same thing. And apparently there's another section, some erratic lane behavior around San Francisco's Market Street. But otherwise, it made the trip, and it's pretty impressive. And uh, you can imagine people who need to make these extended drives to have the full self-driving would be. Uh, uh, of course, full self-driving, we're talking about off the highway. We're talking about everywhere. Oh, cool. Yeah. Fully independent. Very cool. Um, I mean, that animation on the... In the UI on the dash, the is full self-driving, yeah, really cool. The outlines of everything. Oh, yeah. I should also mention though, Los Angeles to San Francisco, climate-wise, is optimal for full self-driving for lidar scanners because you have no, your conditions are pretty consistent, huh. right? As opposed to look at the roads around here right now with all the slush and right. stuff on the roads, which could increase the complexity for mm -hmm. these scanners and may yield different results. So just keep that in mind as well. This is kind of the optimal climate for this particular test. Uh, speaking of Tesla, we were talking about how the Model 3 had been doing well in the JD Power in China and the Shanghai factory had been delivering quality by the looks of it as far as the domestically manufactured Tesla models. Well, the Model Y, it sounds like it's, go, it's about to be the same thing. We have another report from South China Morning Post. Buyers of the locally made Model Y are going to have to wait till February for deliveries to start. Prices came in lower than they had originally expected, which is always a good thing. Uh, starting at $52,000 for the long-range version, excluding a government subsidy. And that's 30% cheaper than the price that was originally quoted for those buyers in that region. So they got a nice little bonus, a nice little surprise, and like, oh, for this type of deal, mm. we can't miss out. Now, obviously, as I've mentioned in the past, Will, there's a lot of competition in that particular market for EVs, way mm. more than here. It's a, it's, there's five or six brands, including one brand uh, that actually uh, 
landed ahead of Tesla in the JD Power rankings. Was that Neo? I'm trying to remember the name of it now. NIO, is that the correct? Yeah, Neo. And uh, I've actually got another story coming up after this one about how Foxconn is preparing to enter the electric car space in a more significant way in that market as well. So it's kind of difficult for us to imagine because here, as far as dedicated electric car companies that only sell electric cars, it's Tesla and that's it. Really, for the most part. I know there's a lot that are emerging now but don't have a product on the road yet, like the various truck companies that are rushing to get a product out and things like that. China's completely different. China, you have so many domestic mm -hmm. players to choose from. So when Tesla succeeds in China, it might actually mean more than when it succeeds here because it's up against other electric competitors that are selling products more similar than what's currently available in the North American market. Uh, but anyways, yeah, so the Model Y, people are really excited about, even though they have to wait, they're willing to pay 52,000, they think they're getting a deal. So this is the Foxconn story. They have sealed a manufacturing deal with Chinese EV startup Byton. Now, Byton has ambitions not just to selling cars domestically, but also to other markets across the globe. And the reason I chose this story, what I think is interesting about it, we obviously understand the intimate relationship between Apple and Foxconn. Just like the story off the top about how Apple asks Foxconn to build, uh, make two mock-ups to prototype shells for folding phones. Imagine Apple tax tasking Foxconn with, hey, we gotta get this electric car thing sorted out. Mm -hmm. And then Foxconn can go and invest. Now, I don't know if this is uh, <laughs> what the stipulations are, the legalities around this, but let's say Foxconn goes and, and seals a major manufacturing deal with a major player in the Chinese EV market, let's say, Biden over here. I think the deal is worth is worth quite a few dollars, $200 million venture. And this company was struggling a little bit actually in the China Chinese EV market. So they come along, <laughs> give them the funds that they need, right? $200 million, but gets to learn a lot along the way, right? They get to learn all kinds of stuff that Apple, well themselves, but also Apple may end up needing help with once they eventually approach their own electric car. Will, like, here's the thing that was, I think we missed, and I just haven't seen it talked about a lot. Tesla is an American company building cars in America for the American market. Now, when they go to some other market, they not always, but often aim to put a factory there as well in order to create cars for that particular market. Mm -hmm. There's incentives to do so when it comes to automotive. However, the interesting strategic component, the interesting uh, man, management that Apple's going to have to deal with here is they've, they haven't done that. They don't make anything in the U.S. They made the one Mac Pro. They made like 15 of them in Texas. Nothing major, nothing at scale. That's all Foxconn for the most part, a couple of other players as well. But that's all other parties in different regions Taiwan, uh, China, Vietnam, et cetera, that are responsible for fa fabricating their goods. Mm -hmm. So once you start doing a car, who's doing it and where? I start wondering, is it Apple themselves? Do they finally open their own factories? Because that's not what they have. Whether it's Foxconn or Wistron, it's always some other party responsible for the manufacturing, which will eventually have the Apple badge. Tesla, on the other hand, even when they go to Shanghai, they put the Tesla badge on the front doors mm -hmm. and on a, on a big building, and everybody works for Tesla. So it's kind of interesting that Apple's not exactly lined up for that. So when I see Foxconn make a move like this, I'm like, hmm, is Apple importing Chinese-made cars for the rest of the world? Is it feasible? Is, it, is there any cost benefit to doing so? Or do they just refine the manufacturing uh, through the extraction of information and learning from some relationship like mm -hmm. this, and then the Foxconn, for example, could open plants to make that eventual Apple car in this variety of regions. That's another way in which it can happen. But anyway, this got me thinking about it because of this big investment and Foxconn betting on cars, because it's not really 
their area of expertise, but they're seeing how the tech world and the car world is merging now, and they're getting ahead of the game. And I think it helps them strategically, especially considering Apple's potential for that car in the in the future. Here's a really weird one. Epic Games, they bought a mall. They bought <laughs> Epic Games decided to buy an old suffering mall. You know how often we cover uh there's some I have some weird attraction to urban decay. I have some weird attraction to abandoned malls. Uh-huh. There's something just uh weirdly engaging about that content it's all over youtube like people will tour an abandoned mall i can't be the only one i can't be the only one there's something about yeah. all the promise and i don't know and then there's also the part of it which is just being alone in a mall which uh -huh. obviously never happened in your life for any reason and and this is an opportunity to really explore a vast in indoor landscape and they're all a little bit unique they all had their own unique kind of touches anyways around the united states the mall as we know it is uh, closing down and obviously covid has accelerated that process it's not what it used to be and epic games has decided to buy up the Cary town center in order to uh, move it's its headquarters. This will be its new headquarters. Epic plans to turn the mall into a 980,000 square foot global headquarters by 2024. C canceling plans last year for a mix of office, retail, and residential spaces, which was, I guess, another proposal for the space. The announcement hasn't been completely met positively. Some citizens of the region had hoped for... Like a revival? Yeah, or, or some space that they could utilize, seeing as how it used to represent a hub for the community. Yeah, the original the original plan was for 1.2 million square feet of office space in seven buildings, 360 square, f square feet of retail, 1,800 residential units, a hotel, and 10 acres of parks. There was another proposal that IKEA would take over the mall, mm -hmm. but they uh, they backed out of that. So, look, I don't know. It's one of those things where, yeah, you would love it, to be utilized in such a fashion that can benefit the community. However, the question is, that's such a cool photo with the pink and the teal, so dated, mm. but but still in good shape. Anyway, Will's showing me pictures of abandoned malls right now, so I'm about to go completely off track if I don't keep this on the rails right now. Okay, yeah. But anyway, look, if Epic is in your town, then I presume uh they're hiring people and it can be good for business and then the other businesses you can start near their business you can have a little coffee shop you can have a uh right. a bike store you can have a so there's that benefit to it but i understand that there's going to be some nostalgia associated with it having been a public space mm -hmm. i mean it's a private building but like public hangout and then turning into a global headquarters for a giant company but it's just interesting. We were all sitting around thinking about, or we've been talking about, what are we going to do with all these abandoned malls? Here's one example. Yeah. At least at least they can make something out of it. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you something, man. What do you think is the smallest apartment that you could live in? Uh, how, how small? And for how long? Uh, just one floor. One floor. Okay. We talking about one floor. Like, can we? Can it be multi-level? No, we're talking about just the like a change of scenery. We're talking about the smallest apartment that you uh, could live in. For how long? Ten years. Ten years. Yeah, ten years. Oh. Ten years. It would have to be at least. Uh, can your bed be in the kitchen? Yes or no? Uh, I for ten years. That's no. I I can't do that. Maybe for like a year mm. as an experience, but. So Hong Kong, small apartments, right? Yeah. Nano, nano apartments. The real estate market in Hong Kong has not really suffered all that much throughout this pandemic. You are still having tremendous real estate costs. It's just so jam packed. It's so limited for expansion. Uh -huh. Yeah. Space is at such a premium. Just building upwards. Nano apartments accounted for a record 13% of sales in 2019. 
Units smaller than two parking spaces still fetch $645,000 USD. And what Will's showing now is a picture of one of these units. The bed and TV is next to the countertop in the kitchen. That's the whole thing. Like this, you're, you're getting stressed out and claustrophobic right now. You took a deep breath. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not a good outlook for your life, <laughs> like in this case. <laughs> No. Well, it it looks nice. Like it's very modern inside. It's sure. just the space of it. It's just something that I guess maybe I'm not used to. No, no, well, neither you you nor I are used yeah. to. If we we grew up around here, there's plenty of space. You can't even. There's nowhere really to walk to, to stretch stand even. to stretch. Uh, you couldn't. Yeah. I don't know. You're in your bed for everything too. Yeah. Like you're 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 basically on your bed. If you're in your apartment, you're on your bed. Like, where do you eat? I guess you eat there too. I, I, it looks like that bed folds up into, yeah, into but, a couch. Look, people have gotten more efficient at doing this with the tiny homes. You're and right. Yeah. Things like this. People have done a better job of it. Even the one you're showing is, uh, is I mean, for what it is, is kind of nice looking. I don't know where the window is. That's another terrifying Ooh, aspect. Yeah, you're right. It's like no. Not even a small little window. Or like a skylight. Yes, yeah, something. It's not there. 13% of apartments sold in 2019 were less than 260 square feet. Smaller than two car parking spaces. Uh, these tiny units accounted for only 0.2% of sales in 2010. So in 2010, people were not that interested in those tiny, like nano size apartments. However, that 0.2% is now up to 13% in 2019. So the affordability goes out the window, but people still don't want to leave or can't leave. Mm. And so they're taking what they have and turning it into the only thing they can get, right. which is this shrinking of the physical spaces. It's the, it has been the least affordable housing market for a very long period of time and by a long shot. Funny enough, on that uh, list of non-affordable living, Two Canadian cities in there, Toronto, yeah. Toronto and Vancouver. Vancouver coming in second, but it's still at like half of the. Uh, it's twice as affordable as Hong Kong, comparative to what people make in that region. These are adjusted, but also mm -hmm. on the list: Sydney, Melbourne, Auckland, San Jose, San Francisco, and London. But to put that in perspective, Hong Kong is a 20.8 and London, England is an 8.2. So tremendously expensive place, which has caused this shrinking of spaces. It's like some have called it a coffin. Uh, I wouldn't want to spend too much time there either, particularly right now with COVID and everything else. If you can't get out of the house either, it's a rough ride. What if you have a noisy neighbor too? Right. I'm thinking the walls might be pretty thin. Just for <laughs> I the don't space. know, man. I don't know. It, it, it was kind of something similar to the conversation around New York and the style of apartments. It's one thing to have a tiny apartment yeah. if you spend a lot of time at restaurants and bars and at work. And so what? Who cares? You just sleep there. But if you're expected to spend a lot of time there, I think then the space comes into question a little bit more. Uh, we have a, a retro-inspired black PlayStation 5 here. This company super... Super 5, I guess. They want to sell you... I'm actually a bit confused as to what they're selling you. Whether you send them your console or you buy an entire console from them. They say the retro-inspired PlayStation 5 console is from 649 and check back soon. So I guess that includes the console, mm. not just the customization. The production will be limited to 304 units. It includes a retro-inspired console plus controller plus colorized logo insert. Shipping late spring 2021 basically what they did is they took the current design of the playstation 5 and tried to make it look like a playstation 2 right okay. that's the color scheme on a playstation 2 if you recall you had the blue light on the front the colorized playstation logo obviously the colorized uh triangle square x and uh, circle buttons on the uh on the controller as well i think it's a pretty good look uh, however, obviously these devices are in very short supply. So this company is going to have to accumulate 304 units so that they can produce themselves. And then people are going to have to wait in line to purchase them themselves. Now they do say the console will not be disassembled as part of the conversion process. The side panels will be removed as part of the conversion. So I don't know what they're going to do. They're going to be painting those side panels or what? Uh, 
But either way, it's not going to be helpful if you already have a PlayStation 5. It doesn't seem that there's any method for getting your PlayStation 5 modded if you want a black one. However, there is going to be a black PlayStation 5 solution from our pals over at dbrand. They're working on black side panels. I don't know how much they've shared publicly, but on their Instagram account, they keep publishing pictures of it. And so that's going to be another way. If you already have a PlayStation 5, it's going to be another way to black it out yourself. As you can see in the images, Willie Will, Will Do just brought up. And it doesn't have... It's not going to have those retro elements, like the colorized PlayStation logo. It kind of is going to look even more simple, just black. But still, some people really wanted a black PlayStation 5. And there's, it's finally where the, the secondary market is starting to pick up some of that slack through conversions or accessories in order to do it. So that's kind of cool. Harvard professor believes that a bizarre asteroid from 2017 was actually alien technology. We're getting into the weird zone of this uh, of this podcast. Of this episode. You know yeah. it's always towards the end. We got to reward yeah. the people who stick with us till the end. Uh, this is, it's, it's a really interesting article about the shape of asteroids and how consistent they are and how their movement patterns are somewhat predictable and eventually how this particular professor came to the conclusion that this one was unusual enough to potentially be considered something other than an asteroid. So this Harvard professor, A.V. Avi Loeb, the chair of Harvard's Department of Astronomy, believes that the first sign that we'll get of alien intelligence won't actually be a spacecraft. It's more likely to be space trash, and which kind of makes sense. We were talking about space junk recently. Yeah, alien human, trash. Right, floating around out yeah. there and not necessarily happening upon us intentionally. So this piece, this object was the first known interstellar object to enter our solar system from the direction of Vega, which is a star 25 light years away. And let me tell you something. Anything comes from the direction of Vega, I'm, I'm paying attention. Okay. Anything. Uh, this object was known as Oumuamua. Oumuamua. Hmm? That, do you think I got that or what? I think you got it. <laughs> O-U-M-U-A-M-U-A. It made its closest approach to the sun, and by the end of September, it had traveled past Venus. So it came past Earth at close to 60,000 miles per hour. Mm. The first thing that was weird about it was the shape. The object was about 100 yards long and shaped like a, like a cigar. When, and that's not, normally the, that's not normally the shape of an asteroid. Giant alien cigar? Giant, yeah, that's right. They were finished with it. <laughs> It was unusual. It was also unusually bright, ten times more reflective than a typical stony asteroid or comet. So ten times more bright, not two times more bright, ten times more bright. And then the other part was the way that it moved. It appeared to have ex excess push away from the sun. So the way I understand this, the sun, incredible gravitational pull, things typically accelerate towards it and then decelerate as they move away from it. Whereas this object continued to have push away from it as if it were being propelled by something else, something more. So Loeb believes that it was being pushed by a force besides the sun's gravity alone. They looked at numbers having to do with the shape and size of the object and concluded that it also wasn't cigar shaped, but possibly a disc less than a millimeter thick with sail-like proportions. Possibly a solar sail which could account for its acceleration as it moved past the sun. Not all scientists agree with this story. Pretty amazing stuff either way. Mm -hmm. A solar sail. I love the idea of it. Very cool. Gathering steam as it moves past the sun. Incredible. It's a huge cigar. From a, a giant alien cigar. There yeah. you go, Will. No, but but he 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 at first they thought that's what it was. And then they decided, no, 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 maybe we're maybe it's actually just a millimeter thin. What the sail? The sail. What? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Disc. A disc. You know how discs are in the community of 
alien uh alien enthusiasts discs uh, discs yeah. and aliens go hand in hand yeah cigars less so <laughs> that may change after this story i don't know singapore airport adds camping and holiday dining deals as it reinvents itself amid coronavirus I don't know. I don't know if you knew this. This Singapore airport is very important to Singapore. A super heavily traveled airport. I mean, all airports are important, mm -hmm. but this was like big deal. People in Singapore travel a lot. It's a small place. So uh, it's also famous, that airport, for that one view, that cool picture of that giant fountain, which people always think is so futuristic in the center of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you walk that path with all the plants and stuff. Super cool. Uh, apparently passenger numbers in November were down 98% on 2019 levels. That's pretty wild. So Ooh. basically business is gone completely. And uh, what they tried to do instead was set up these tents and have people do this gl glamping. That's glamorous camping. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you knew that well. Mm -hmm. And I guess you go there with your family, you book one of these things for like 300 bucks and... Hey, you're just happy to do something other than you're happy to have some type of leisure, I suppose, is the way that it works. And they have space and apparently they have forestry in there. That's right. You know? Yeah. They're 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 it's it they want look, they want people back in the airport. They're trying to get the restaurants back up and running. And they're trying to do it in a safe way. So I watched there was a little video. I don't know if you're able to find it, but there was a little video there. You may have to go to YouTube to get it. Okay. Um there's a little video showcasing how it all works. How you walk up to this booking desk and everyone's wearing masks. And I guess that's how they figure out how to do it in a safe manner in the presence of COVID. But I don't know. Could you spend the night inside the airport inside of a tent? Yeah. You would do this. It's a, it seems like a fun little experiment. Maybe do it for like a night or two. Well, that's all they want from you. That's all they're looking yeah. for. You stay for a night. It, it is interesting. The whole ceiling, the, there? the whole ceiling is windows, so you kind of feel like you're outside too, I guess. And you can see they check the temperatures on everyone when they arrive for their for their glamorous camping trip, a luxurious form of traditional camping. See, you get, catch a couple of photos. You got the hand sanitizer right in your tent. <laughs> it's it's almost surreal, but you know, yeah. Camping well, it's, in this, uh... it's. It's a weird combination of things. But they're looking for romance. They're looking for things to do. And uh, they're trying to make a comeback. Rental rental fees range from $100 to $270, depending on which themed tent you, you choose. Singapore trying to make a comeback. Everybody's trying to make a comeback in 2020, including you and me. Well, yeah. we're trying to make a comeback. Mm -hmm. 2020. 2021. What am I yeah. talking about? Yeah.